This training covers pneumatic actuator local loop applications, such as this perimeter fin tube heating valve. Many pneumatic actuators are also found on other unitary equipment, such as fan coils, VAV boxes, unit ventilators, and rooftop units. Pneumatic actuators are also found on central HVAC equipment regulating heating, cooling, humidification, and air flows. We also find pneumatic devices interfacing with electrical equipment such as fans and pumps. In our last video, we discussed how a pneumatic controller modulates its output to proportion the right amount of heating or cooling. This whole concept is dependent upon the actuator's ability to smoothly apply this modulating signal to the damper or valve. This video will examine how these actuators perform this task. Here's a quick review. The previous video detailed the inherently modulating characteristic of pneumatic controllers. The pneumatic system usually operates at 20 psi, then the pneumatic controller controls the outlet pressure. This outlet pressure is called branch line pressure, or BLP. It's this modulating branch line that then modulates an actuator to complete its task of positioning valves or dampers proportionally. Let's first examine pneumatic damper actuators. Damper actuators extend a push rod as increasing control signal air pressure inflates a rolling diaphragm chamber. The rolling diaphragm minimizes friction and wear, providing a very long and trouble-free actuator life. As the rod is extended, a return spring is compressed. As air pressure is decreased, the return spring retracts the push rod. The push rod is attached to the damper drive blades via a linkage assembly. The damper motor may be mounted internally or external to the duct, and the linkage will involve push rods, pivot arms, and ball joints to meet mounting and movement requirements. A damper is configured normally open if the actuator return spring pulls the damper open. In this diagram, the damper axle is rotated counterclockwise to open, providing the normally open damper configuration. A damper is configured normally closed if the return spring of the actuator pulls the damper closed. In this diagram, the damper blade axle is rotated clockwise to close, providing the normally closed configuration. Because the return spring will return the damper to its normal position on a total loss of air pressure, this position is also referred to as the fail position. The return springs in pneumatic actuators are available in spring ranges. A spring range is the air pressure required to begin the stroke through to the pressure required to complete the stroke. Spring ranges are available to complement a sequencing control scheme. That is, to coordinate the damper movements with other control action in the air handler. Or a particular spring range may be selected to provide adequate close-off pressure for a damper. In this example, the 5 to 10 psi spring will not begin to compress until 5 psi of air is applied to the diaphragm. From 5 to 10 psi, the shaft will move toward the fully extended position. Above 10 psi, the shaft remains extended. Keep in mind that if this example was then applied to a normally closed damper, the damper would be held closed with five pounds of spring pressure, which is then the close-off pressure holding the damper closed. The distance any shaft extends is the stroke specification, which will then vary between actuator models. Next, we'll examine specifics of pneumatic valve actuators. Pneumatic valve actuators consist of a diaphragm, push rod, and spring similar to a damper actuator. The rolling diaphragm design minimizes wear, providing a long, trouble-free actuator life. The spring to diaphragm relationship provides the normally open or normally closed configuration, and spring pressure ranges are available for sequential control of valves or to provide positive close-off force. The combination actuator and valve displayed here depicts a normally open configuration. That is, as branch line air pressure is reduced, the spring pushes the stem up, lifting the stem and disc, and the valve moves towards open. If for any reason the air pressure is lost, the valve would go full open. Valves are available in several configurations of normally open and normally closed design. 
It has all to do with the relationship between the actuator and the valve body. First of all, we need to understand that two-way valve bodies are either direct acting or reverse acting. A direct acting valve body closes to flow as the stem is pushed down. This design may also be called a stem down closes type of valve. Conversely, a reverse acting valve body opens to flow as the stem is pushed down. This design may also be called a stem down opens type of valve. Your catalogs will list valve bodies one way or the other. But note, there is no return spring in these diagrams. So there is no normally open or normally closed discussion possible at this point. We will control either valve type with either a direct acting or reverse acting actuator, which will then give us our final control configuration. Air pressure on the diaphragm of the direct acting actuator will push the actuator stem down, compressing the spring and extending the stem. As air pressure is removed, the spring will retract the stem. Thus, the normal position is stem retracted and will be listed as a normally retracted stem actuator or direct acting. Conversely, air pressure on the diaphragm of the reverse acting actuator will push the actuator stem up, compressing the spring while retracting the stem. As air pressure is removed, the spring will extend the stem back out. Thus, the normal position is stem extended, and again, we will find this type listed as a normally extended stem actuator or reverse acting. But note again, there is no valve in this diagram, so there is nothing to open or close. So there is no normally open or normally closed discussion possible at this point. When an actuator is combined with a valve body, the resultant spring force acting upon the valve stem will now make the valve either normally open or normally closed. Examine the two normally open valve assemblies in this diagram. In either combination, that is a DA actuator and a DA valve, or a RA and an RA, the spring force will open the valve when no air pressure is present. Thus, both assemblies are normally open. The valve assemblies in the lower diagrams are both normally closed. In either combination, DA and RA, or RA and DA, the spring force will close the valve when no air pressure is present. Thus, both assemblies are normally closed. Pneumatic actuators will always have a listed spring range. The spring range determines the pressure change required for full movement, or stroke, of the actuator from open to closed, or closed to open. As an example, if this valve has a 4 to 11 spring range, then at 4 pounds, the valve pictured here is full open. And as the branch is increased, the valve moves towards the closed position. And at 11 pounds, the valve will be fully closed. Thus, the spring range of a valve defines the start and stop of the valve stroke. The spring range is often applied to achieve tight close-off against water or steam flow. The air pressure or spring pressure at one end of the stroke or the other will hold a normally open or normally closed valve tightly closed. More on this concept later. Spring ranges are needed for several reasons, such as valve sequencing, to meet specific control strategies. This diagram is an example of a sequential control strategy utilizing actuator spring ranges. In this example, the thermostat is a single temperature, direct acting TP970A. One thermostat controls both heating and cooling. We know that when the room temperature falls, we need heat, and the heating valve should open. But as the room temperature goes up, the room needs cooling. The cooling valve is NC, normally closed, with an 8 to 12 PSI spring range. The heating valve is NO, normally open, with a 2 to 7 PSI spring range. This is a very common setup. Notice both valves receive the same branch line from the stat. On a rise in room temperature, the branch line pressure will rise. When the pressure rises to 8 PSI, the NC cooling valve begins to stroke open, and at 12 PSI, the cooling valve will be fully open. On a fall in room temperature, the branch line pressure will fall. When the pressure falls to 7 PSI, 
the NO heating valve begins to stroke open. And at 2 PSI, the heating valve will be fully open. This is a very common control sequence. A discussion on spring ranges necessitates a discussion on the concept of tight close-off. A valve must be able to stop the flow of water or steam as controlled. A valve and actuator combination, either pneumatic or electric, will be selected to close off tightly under normal operating conditions and should not leak if water or steam pressure increases. Head pressure varies and can easily exceed a valve's close-off rating and push the disc open. A normally open valve can increase pressure to hold the valve tightly closed. A normally closed valve depends on adequate spring pressure to hold the valve tightly closed. Water or steam leakage can get excessive, and even a small amount of leakage will cause loss of control and wasted energy and premature valve wear. And leakage that is allowed to continue can cause an entire system to fail. Tables similar to this are found in literature pieces and guide us in the proper selection of a valve and actuator combination to ensure an adequate close-off force. This is an example of a pneumatic selection table. In this example, this selected valve body, when coupled with this particular actuator, will close off tightly with no leakage against head pressures up to 122 pounds. When additional control power is required, valves with a positive positioner can be applied. This valve actuator positioner is connected to the actual valve stem and will provide additional control power to the actuator diaphragm. A controller branch line signal pilots the positive positioner relay. The relay compares this signal to the actual physical valve position and then adjusts main air directly to the actuator diaphragm to hold the valve true to the control signal. And it has a built-in sequencing function for sequential valve operation to meet system control logic strategies. Pneumatic controllers develop considerable torque, but a positive positioner can be added for additional damper control power. This device can apply full main air pressure to keep the damper closed tightly, or add additional control pressure to hold damper position true during abrupt airflow velocity or pressure changes in the duct. It does this by sensing the actual damper position via a connected spring attached to, to the damper shaft. As an additional benefit, this device can also perform a control sequencing function and gang together multiple dampers. A pneumatic control signal can also be produced by a DDC controller via an electric to pneumatic transducer. The analog output voltage of a DDC controller will be proportionally converted to a modulating 3 to 13 psi pressure signal, providing efficient, smooth modulation of pneumatic actuators. This arrangement is often referred to as a hybrid system. Why a pneumatic actuator on a DDC controller? A couple of good reasons. A pneumatic control system may have been upgraded to DDC, and it was cost-effective to leave the pneumatic actuators in place. The existing pneumatic actuators were working good. The tubing runs and compressor were already in place. Pneumatics provide excellent torque, and they are reliable. Or, back when the new DDC system was installed, Pneumatic actuators were selected because they offered better torque, and install cost compared to electric actuators available at the time was better. You can find more information on Honeywell's pneumatic controls at customer.honeywell.com. Here you will find brochures, installation instructions, and the pneumatic controls manual.